such a great privilege to have Paul and Sue here with us today uh, over, this, over this weekend. Um, Paul is someone that I first got to know um, on an online course when Nicola and I were still living in China. And I found uh, that I was sitting in my living room listening to this man's dulcet tones, hearing his stories, hearing his insights. And um, he, he wrecked, yeah, he still wrecks, he wrecked my world um, because he gave me insight into what it is to live as a son. Because just like Paul, my dad died when I was 11, and uh, I stopped being a son at uh, age 11. And uh, it's, it, there's, there's such freedom in reconnecting uh, in a meaningful way as a, as a son. Um, and just what he brought last night, I feel, is just such a helpful introduction uh, and, and such a, a vital foundation for us as we, as we live this life. Otherwise, we will go out there and try to do the works of the kingdom, but do it as orphans and do it with hearts that are weak and hearts that do not reflect the nature of our God. It's such a pleasure to have you guys with us today. Please welcome Mr. Paul Manware. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you weren't here last night? There's no punishment involved in this. I just <laughs> want to just, you know, not, not chain up. Okay, just wanted a rough idea because there was some awareness. Uh, let me just do a couple of things by way of introduction. Um, I, there's two books of mine at the back. There's another book on its way. It'll be, uh, it'll be sometime the beginning of next year. I'm trying to Put some stuff out if you're interested in following me. I've got some e-courses that I'm developing as well. Um, but the two books that I've currently written is What on Earth is Glory is the first book that I wrote. Um, whoever started us down the track of creativity this morning could have skewed the whole conference because one of my favorite subjects, there's a chapter in here on beauty and glory. Um, I, I've been really encouraged recently by um, developing a relationship with a, with a man who's... Uh, who's part of a family that owns a Michelin-starred restaurant, which is good news in itself. <laughs> um, but he attributes some of his personal freedom of being able to work in, in the family business and not be a missionary, which he was, uh, to, uh, to me talking about beauty and glory and creativity. And um, that's a, just one piece of it. There's some other chapters in here that, that actually outline my, my sonship journey there's a chapter in here, believe it or not, written by my dad, who, uh, who wrote the sermon in 1957 before I was born, and, and uh, I transcribed word for word his sermon, didn't change a thing, and it would fit Bethel perfectly. It's a, it's a curious uh, piece of my story, um, but it's, it's what on earth is glory. Um, I think that we've made glory a bit too out there, and it's tangible. Um, it must be tangible. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Um, the whole earth is actually already full of His glory. It's just waiting to be filled with the knowledge of His glory, which is our assignment. Um, and uh, so a number of chapters uh, in there. A um, couple of my... I, I'm honored that R.T. Kendall would, uh, would have endorsed it, but he said, shows in a readable and practical way how to bring glory to God in your own life here on earth, which... It's kind of fun, and Artie's become a friend of mine, which is a great privilege of my life. And uh, so I know he really liked it, and Jack Taylor really liked it. So if they like it, I must be on to something. So anyone got a birthday today? Lady at the back with a birthday there. Maybe somebody can just run that to her. And then my second book here is, is Kisses from a Good God, abbreviated. Most people just say it's called Kisses, which is kind of funny. Um, and this is my, my, uh, my journey through prostate cancer. 2008, I was given the diagnosis that nobody wants to have um, of, uh, of the big C, and uh, this is my walk through that journey. I don't believe it's just for people who have cancer. Uh, it's for anybody who's either walking other people through a journey or you're walking through a journey. It might be sickness. It might be divorce. It might be loss. It might be just life sucks, and you're trying to work out where's God in the middle of this journey and um, it, it was an unusual journey for me. Um, and he told me, he said, uh, I had this unusual week where my language, he kissed me every day for a week. 
And what I mean by that was he reached down into my world, into my language, into things that I could understand in the midst of what I didn't understand and said things through people, through dreams, uh, I mean, curious things. And he said to me, I'll kiss you every day if you let me. And, uh, and it was this sort of thing about me leaning into that. Um, there's a chapter in here that my life was literally saved by a dream, not by my dream, but by Benny Johnson's dream that she had about me. And I remembered it in the middle of the night when I needed some help. And, uh, and God gave me the wisdom actually to save my own life, literally. Um, so that's in there. Um, the, one of the phrases that, that Sue, uh, Sue kind of gave me right at the beginning of the journey was, uh, I, I said this sort of thing, you know, nothing prepared me, which is what we all say at times of sudden crisis or sudden promotion. And it's a lie. The issue is not have you been prepared. It's the issue is can you access the preparation? And, uh, and we've all, I believe, been prepared by God for our journeys um, and for what happens to us. He wastes nothing. He gets us ready. I believe it with all my heart. My favorite chapter is probably the chapter that's called Resign. And uh, uh, my, my friend Steve Witt walked into my office one Friday afternoon, had a dream about me, which had already happened, gave me a prophetic word, which was absolute what I needed, but then said, can I pray for you? And he prayed one word, re-sign. And I knew exactly what it was about. Um, because when you, ha when you go through a crisis, you, your, your vision drops, I think, by about 20%. That's, a, that's a, just an estimate. But your head goes down, and you're not lifting your head up. You're not looking up there. You're looking. You're just struggling to survive, to keep going forwards. And there's a point that we all need to come to where we re-sign to the fullness of what God has for our lives. And, uh, and I, that Friday afternoon, I re-signed. Uh, I knew exactly what it was about. A spirit of resignation had taken over. I was resigned to just kind of survival. And that day, I re-signed. The fun part is that a few years later, Steve Witt himself was in the middle of a crisis, um, didn't have the energy to get out of his chair and was pretty much saying, God, I'm perfectly willing for you to take me home. He was going through a major cancer battle and there was only one book he could reach from his chair, which happened to be mine. And he turned to the chapter that he gave me the word for and he read that chapter to himself and he re-signed that day with the word he gave me that he got back from my book. And, uh, and he tells that story, and uh, so some of you might need to do that. So this is my journey. Anyone uh, walking a friend through cancer right now, a close friend that you're walking through? No? Man, you're cancer-free around here? One over there. Lady over there, you're walking. Yeah, the lady at the back there. Maybe somebody could just pass that. And both those are available at the back. My wife Sue will be there at the end of this uh, session and the beginning of this evening's session, if you want to buy those. I also... Um, I think both Peter and Gary said, hey, tell, tell a little bit about what's going on with me and I'll do that and then I'll, and then I'll turn to preach. Um, so uh, we spent 15 years in Bethel, California. Um, the, the very quick headlines are in, in 2012, although I think Sue, probably Sue around that time was beginning to think, you know, is it time for us to move back to Europe? Um, but I think I was probably still at that stage. This is it. We're in California. You know, we've got our green card. We'll, we'll stay here. It's, the climate's pretty good, you know. Um, although Reading's climate's not that great. I'd have preferred San Diego if I had any choice at all. But um, I got given a prophetic word which changed my life, um, literally changed my life. And it was about preaching in stadiums. And from there, I started to get connected um, with, uh, with more of what God was doing in Europe and... Uh, and we get given prophetic words about it's, it's time for you to move back. Um, bizarre scenarios. People who've never met us who say things like, I don't know where home is, but it's time for you to go home. And, uh, and so began a kind of a, a change in our hearts. We actually thought we were going to lead a church in England. Um, and the, the doors were sort of open, close, open, and then went bang, slam shut. Now, they slammed shut when we decided we were moving. Um, so um, we'd already decided, so we're on our way, and we, we, jo we chose that we weren't making our decision based on that door shutting, that we, the, the word had already been said. And so um, that was about the beginning of, of 2016 <coughs> that the door slammed shut. That, uh, that Christmas, actually, just before that, we'd sat in my mother's house 
um, with a bag of memorabilia from Sue's mother, um, which was actually um, the 60 years experience of Sue's grandfather in Europe. And uh, on the top of that, we were just in the final stages, really, of what do we do? And on the top of that pile of memorabilia was a book, Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wormbrandt. Uh, just happens to be a first edition, just happens to have a foreword written by her grandfather. And, uh, and we looked at it and we said, it's our inheritance, Europe's our inheritance, we're, we're going home. And so, so we, we moved back um, to Europe because um, we are Europeans. If I can just make that clear, we are British Europeans. Hey, we were all Europeans last weekend for the Ryder Cup, weren't we? Yeah? So we can be Europeans for Jesus. I'm not bothered about the politics. I'm just bothered about a continent. Uh, and so we are very much British European. So we talk about moving back to Europe. And um, there's a number of things that we're involved in. One of the things that I'm involved in is esbs.org, europeshallbesaved.org. You can look that up. You can sign up for it. There's no, uh, there's no, no uh, problems and there's no fees to pay or anything like that. I'm not trying to hook you into something. But ESBS is, is really about birthing a movement to connect every, every stream, every denomination, every tribe, every sphere, every country um, with one purpose, to see 100 million souls saved in the next 10 years. We, we went for a small target, so we're, um, you know, it's 10%. Um, probably be a billion population in Europe in 10 years' time, and so 10% is 100 million. And um, it's just an exciting thing to be a part of. It's actually an extraordinary thing to be a part of. Um, we're just about to launch um, what we're calling the Roundtable Strategy this year, which I will probably be connecting some of the leaders here to. And the Roundtable Strategy is really just to, to connect as many people as possible who are leaders in churches, networks, uh, spheres of influence, geographic regions, um, so that, you know, the Bible says one can put a thousand to flight, but two, ten thousand. When we connect, when we work together, and God is doing something in this continent of Europe, I have absolutely no doubt about it. No doubt about it. It is Europe's time. Our language has changed. Everywhere we go, people are saying the same thing. It's Europe's time. I mean, don't look at the newspapers. Don't, don't look at that. Look, look at what the God is doing, the Spirit of God is doing. At this moment, there is a tour going on, the Holy Spirit nights. Um, I think something like 12 to 14 cities um, where a young man called Marcus Vence started a movement. Um, I'm proud to say that he's a German, but it's funded by a British philanthropist. The, the whole movement is. Um, they will have seen thousands of young people gathering together week by week, night by night in the cities of Europe. Um, we've got the Europe Shall Be Saved uh, movement. I'm part of Awakening Europe. We've just done our fourth Awakening Europe uh, stadium event. Next year is in Vienna, and this is the first time we've known the dates in advance. So June the 13th to the 16th in Vienna. Uh, is awakening Europe. Um, it, it's just incredible what God's doing. And there's this, there's this cross-pollination going on. We went to Nuremberg, Germany, and, uh, and the whole thing. I mean, it's crazy. God's funding this stuff. You know, I mean, really, we were 800,000 euros short on the Sunday in Nuremberg. 800,000 euros, just a small amount. People would say to Ben Fitzgerald, who's running it, what's plan B? He'd say, jail. He said, there is no plan B. We don't have a plan B. We took up an offering on that Sunday at the wrong meeting and raised double what was needed, which wow. meant there was an investment for the next event when we went to Stockholm. Germans went to Stockholm. We go to Stockholm, and, and people in, um, in Stockholm, people came from Prague for some reason. Uh, there's this cross-pollination going on. We were just in Latvia. Latvia had sent hundreds of people to the event in Prague. We're going to Vienna next year. There's something happening. I guarantee you this. Put any country in Europe into a Google, Google it, and go revival in that country. It doesn't matter which country you choose. There's a revivalist. There's a reformer. There's some, there's some great history. We were just in Latvia. The Moravians pretty much birthed the Christian work in, in Latvia. We were in Czech Republic, and you find that there's John Haas 100 years before Luther, and there's a Reformation. It, it's just, it doesn't matter where you look. This is our history. 
our European history, and of course you've only got to look at, at ours, go to Scotland and you've got John Knox and give me Scotland or I die, go to Wales and you've got the, the incredible Welsh revival, you know, look at England, early part of the 18th century, a destitute nation in serious trouble and Wesley and Whitfield show up and we see thousands, hundreds of thousands come to Jesus, which becomes the birthplace for the, the incredible things that happened uh, when we saw, you know, the, the end of slavery, when we saw hospitals and, and schools and children's homes open, when we saw people like the Howard League for Penal Reform reforming. It doesn't matter where you look. I was just in Ireland uh, this, this summer uh, and blown away by the, by the history of, of Ireland there. Uh, and of course, you know, St. Patrick and, and so, so much else there. So this is Europe's time. I believe it with all my heart. This is our time. And, uh, and I love what God's done in, in the other continents of the world. And I'm more than happy for America to be saying America shall be saved. But as for us, we came back for this. Everywhere we go, we're encouraged. We're excited. This is time for us to lift up our heads as, as Brits, as Europeans, and be confident in our history, be confident in who God has called us to be. So that's a little bit about what, what we're seeing. And uh, there's, uh, it's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. And there isn't much more fun than standing in stadiums in the countries of Europe and watching hundreds of people run to the front. There isn't much more. And, and I know people are going, oh, I'm not sure about stadium evangelism. Well, you know, in some respects, I'm not that sure either, except everywhere you go, you can find somebody who found Jesus in a Billy Graham conference. And it's probably those that were saved in the Billy Graham events that became the leaders of the Jesus people movement in the, in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm totally sold out to it, but it's not the only thing, is, is what I would say. It's like, we, let's do the stadium event. We had a school this last year, the January this year. I'm doing it again next year. Funny things you get involved in, you know. Did a school, 156 people came to a school. The school was for mass evangelism. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing anyway, you know? We had people talking about how you rent stadiums. <laughs> it's useful information and what to look for. There were over 20 people in that conference, 20, over 20 people. And they were in their 20s and early 30s who are currently renting stadiums wow. by faith. It's like, this is good stuff. This is just exciting stuff to be a part of. So, uh, and I also do believe that God is really drawing the evangelists back, um, the, true, uh, the true office holders, as it were, the evangelists, back into the local church. I really do believe it. He's, he's helping them, and it's actually related to the whole message of, of Father and Father Heart. But he's drawing the evangelists back into the local church. And I, I believe for the purpose of seeing the increase in the local church. Um, and uh, it's very encouraging to, to see these uh, men and women uh, being really stirred up. So, yeah, that's what's happening. So if you want to get involved or just get onto ESBS.org, get out to Vienna next June. It'll, be, it'll just be a lot of fun. Um, I'm pretty sure the worship will be the same. People like Jeremy Riddle and, and Lindy Conant and uh, Jake Hamilton. And so they're just fun events to be part of. All right. So... Um, well, last night I told really my story, um, and uh, today I, I want to just try and put some context into why I believe that, that this message, the message of the Father Heart and Sonship, is for such a time as this. I have another message about what time is it, which I'm, I'm not going not to go into, um, but just by way of background, um, Mordecai, uh, sent a message to Esther. Many of you will have had Esther 4.14 given to you as a prophetic word. Who knows if you have not attained royalty for such a time as this? For me, what that means is, who knows if you haven't become a son or a daughter of the King of Kings for such a time as this? Who knows if you have not found your identity for such a time as this? Uh, actually, the night uh, uh, I had my surgery, and it was the night when I saved my life in the middle of, of the night, just before I went unconscious, which I always make a joke of if Chris Valentin's in the audience. He gave me a prophetic word and I slipped unconscious. Um, you know, um, but uh, he gave me a word. I didn't know what that word meant until the summer of this year. I thought I knew what it meant until the summer of this year, but then I realized what it meant. He said, you're Mordecai. Now, I just thought, ah, 
I'm a bit of a champion of women. I, I, I'm good with that. I mean, I'm never going to stop being a champion of women for lots of reasons. I'm married to one, and my, I was born by one. So, you know, I mean, like, but I mean, I, I, and I'm going to touch on it actually later on. I really um, uh, ha always have been. It's just, to me, it's never been. An, women in leadership is just not an issue. You, if, if you get past Genesis 126 and you haven't worked out what God thinks about women, then you, that's why there's so many problems. Just sort it out in the first 26 verses of the Bible. I will go there later in case you wonder. But I, I thought it was just, I'm just I'm, I've always been a champion of women in leadership, never been an issue. You know, I was, an, I was a, a male nurse. Don't know why they had to call me a male nurse. Thought the male pit was fairly obvious. But, you know, <laughs> um, you know so I've, it's... I've always worked in, in that environment. So I thought that that was what the word meant. And then I was just walking to a meeting in July, actually the night we lost the semi-final. So painful night, but at least I got a revelation in the same day. So, um, and, uh, and, and I realized this, Mordecai, Mordecai's assignment was to adopt the orphaned influences. Because Esther was an orphan and he adopted her and she was an influencer. And I realized that that verse has a whole lot more to it. It's about adopting the orphaned influencers. And, um, of course, the verse says before it, it, it doesn't just have the, who knows if you have not attained royalty. It actually says this, if you remain silent, relief and deliverance will come from someone else. I, want to, I, want to, I believe this. I believe that the Father Heart message is for such a time as this. Um, it, it, we've, we've had quite a few um, references during this um, morning to freedom. Ultimate freedom is sonship and daughtership. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. It, it's because freedom and sonship are completely and utterly tied together. When we look at Jesus, when we look at the way that Jesus lived, no freer man has le ever lived on the earth than Jesus Christ. No freer man. And yet in many respects... His, he was constrained by love, if I can put it that way. But, but of course, it wasn't, it wasn't a love that was against his will. But he's the most free man that's ever walked on this planet. He could have done anything. The temptations that he faced were not temptations that were, you know, let's imagine something crazy that someone might or might not be able to do. The temptations that he was offered, he could do. He's the freest one that ever lived. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And he modeled freedom as a son. And yet that son would say things like, I must be about my father's business. I only do the things that please him. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And yet he's the freest one that ever lived. See, see sonship. The, what happened when, when we turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament it changed. Our piety, our, our way we, were, we lived was by obedience to the law. And, and then the transition becomes, it's freedom, but our piety is now out of love and devotion. The ultimate son is a prince. The ultimate daughter is a princess. And Jesus is the prince of peace. I, I want to just quickly run through something because understanding the, the way that God always intended this planet to be governed will, will determine how we live. It starts in the garden, begins in the garden, and there are misunderstandings. There are things that we haven't fully understood in, in, in church history. You know, the story in the garden, we, we eat something, whatever it was, fig, apple, peach, who knows what it was, but we, we eat the fruit of a tree and we are removed from the garden. Now let me just throw something into you. Have you ever thought, not what we lost, because most people think about what we lost. But have you ever thought about what God lost? You see, God lost relationship, face-to-face -face relationship with his created kids. Made in his image, which is Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. In the relational image of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're made in a relational image. His heart broke because of the separation that happened because of what we did. We, we think often, I think, about what happened to us, what we lost, but what he lost. Now then there's something he did. Now many of you will know this. 
But there's something that happened. We were removed from the garden. Why were we removed? And the answer to that question determines how you read the rest of the Bible and determines how you live life. We were removed not for punishment. We were removed for protection. We were removed so that we could one day be redeemed because if we'd been left in the garden and we had eaten the fruit of the other tree, we would have been eternally unredeemable. And so we were removed from protection. And that will determine how you read the rest of the book. Because government, the, the, the creation of government, and we are given the assignment to subdue the earth, to govern this earth. So we have been given the assignment to govern. Will we govern out of punishment or out of protection? In other words, will we govern to punish or will we govern to always give access to redemption? God the Father removed us from the garden. He put angels to make sure we didn't go back in. It was not punishment. Here's the thing. There's a world out there that's waiting for a judgment day. It's movies. Judgment day. But somebody, one of these days, will produce a movie called Deliverance Day. Because it's not judgment day. It's not even in my Bible. Now, it is written by somebody in between the verses, judgment day. I've crossed it out. Because it isn't, it, it, he's going to judge for us, not against us. That's in a song somewhere. But he's going to judge for us. God is more like a judge of Britain's Gotten Talent who says, I'm for you, than he is a judge in the court that says, send him down. But our mindset is the wrong picture. You see, Heaven's government is relational. And it, it, right there in the beginning, he sets in place the plan that would say, I will redeem. And, and the beauty of heaven's government, you know, when, when I think about heaven's government, when I think about us praying on earth as it is in heaven, you know, we've, we've got used, very used, uh, and Bill's really helped us obviously with this, with phrases like, there's no cancer in heaven, so there should be none on earth. I love it. That, in other words, says what isn't there shouldn't be here. But there's another part of the prayer. What is there should be here. Which means that what is there is heaven's government. What does heaven's government look like? Jesus, Jesus actually, I believe, prayed for us to receive this in John chapter 17. He said, Father, glorify me with the glory we had before the world was. What's the glory before the world was? What was that? What was there before the world was? There's them. The three of them, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They exist in perfection of love for each other, perfection of honor for each other, perfection of loyalty to each other, and absolute security in each other's identity and purpose. Think of that for a minute, for the way that we exist on earth. If we could live like that, and that's why we have to go through the journey of last night, as I was talking about it, of becoming sons and daughters. Because if we don't become sons and daughters, we won't exist in perfection of love to each other. We won't exist in perfection of loyalty to each other. We won't exist in perfection of honor to each other. And we won't be secure in our own identity and our own purpose. You see, this moment that we get to be on planet Earth is unique. It's absolutely unique. One of the great shifts I believe that's happening is a, is a shift from church first to kingdom first. Which is strange that it took us 2,000 years to do what Jesus said. Because he said, seek first the kingdom. And all these things, which I think church is in all. All these things will be added unto you. You see, this shift from church to kingdom means that no longer is the man of God up here supposed to be the biggest person in the church. The man of God up here, if, I'm just using that title because it, it fits my illustration. The man of God's job up here is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. To raise up people in, in his or her church who are given permission to be bigger than him or her. To go out and do the kingdom stuff. Which means that this man here has to be secure in his identity. 
as a son so that he can live in perfection of love with the person in his congregation who's bigger than him, loyalty to that person and honor for that person, secure in his identity, secure in his purpose. That's the moment we live in. It's a moment to see the establishment of heaven's government on earth. And it will be established by sons and daughters who know who they are. And the great example is Jesus. See, that's heaven's government. Heaven's government is relational government. They didn't have anything else before the world was, did they? So what did they do? They they sat around, I guess, or floated around, or whatever they did. And they said, what do we love? They must have talked about what they love because he is love. What do we love? We love us. Like not yucky love. We love us. Hey, let's have more of us. Let's have more of us. And let's make a place for the more of us to live. So we get creation. And the more of us starts off in a garden. And God the Father has face-to-face relational connection with his created kids. But then we mess up and we sever the relationship. And so we're put outside the garden for protection. And 4,000 years later, the father sends his son to do what he can no longer do, which is have face-to-face relationship with his created kids. And not only do that, but to do everything required to restore the relationship between the father and his created kids. And so secure is the son that before he leaves, he says, I've got to go. But if I don't go, the job can't get finished. And he sends his Holy Spirit because they're secure in their identity and their purpose. And they love each other and they're loyal to each other and they honor each other. And he intends us to live that way. That's the intention. That's the government of heaven. That's, that's what, you see, the father heart message, the message of sonship isn't just like, oh, this is an idea. Let's have a conference. Let's call it that. We know somebody who can talk about that. This is absolutely essential. This is essential to us stepping into our place on this planet and becoming world changers and history makers. This is not just a nice idea. It's not just something to do on a Saturday morning. This is, this is absolutely central to our assignment on earth that we become sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that we love each other, honor each other, are loyal to each other. We're absolutely secure in our identity and our purpose and secure in other people's identity and their purpose. And we start to do what we were put on this planet to do, which is to bring heaven to earth and expand, expand the influence of King Jesus. Yeah. And if we don't get it, we'll fight and we'll disagree. And oh, we'll probably divide and be famous for division. And we'll protest and be famous for protesting instead of being famous for unity and love. He said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Oh, let's split the church again. Let's divide the church again. He prayed, John chapter 17 I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. And the key is sonship. You can run through the Bible. You can run through it. This is a relational textbook. The greatest relational textbook has ever been written, ever will be written. Now, nothing can touch it. And of course, it's more than a textbook. It's a guide. It's a relationship. It's an introducer to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will introduce us to things in it. It's this this incredible dance that we get to be a part of. I I love Isaiah. I nearly learned to say Isaiah again. I went to Isaiah because people didn't apparently understand what the book Isaiah was, where I was. I love Isaiah chapter 9. I love it. I've read it in... Probably as many circumstances as anyone in here has because I've read it in prisons and hospitals and all sorts of different places. And of course, many of us know it from the great Messiah. Isn't it incredible, by the way? It always makes me smile. Can you imagine being known that something that you wrote 
being known by your name and the Messiah. Handel's Messiah. It just blows me away. It's like, you can't say Messiah without Handel. You can't say Handel without Messiah. There's a message in there somewhere. It probably should be true of all of us, that you shouldn't be able to say your name without attaching Jesus to it. But we all know. We all know the great verses. Because even the non-Christian, opera-going world knows to stand when the great verses are sung. A child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. It's not the government that we see on earth. It's the government that we see in heaven on the shoulders of a son. And, and that picture in Isaiah is the picture that says that a child is born. A child is an offspring. But a son is given. A son is a bearer of the family name. Even Jesus had to go from offspring to bearer of the family name. The picture in Isaiah is probably various accounts of it, but it's probably something to do with the culture of the day. When a, uh, a nobleman would have a, a son, and the nobleman would give that son to be taken care of by a senior servant in the house, the child would be raised to some sort of age of adulthood, depending on the region. And at that point, the servant would take the child back to the nobleman and would represent and say, this is your son. And the nobleman would go out into a public place and would declare, this is my son. If he writes checks on the family business, I'll back them up. And we see the same thing happen with Jesus, recorded at his baptism, where Jesus, who's been raised, as it were, by a senior servant, his name was Joseph. He was raised, he's, he's, a, he's a child, he's, a, he's an offspring. But at his baptism, he's taken out into a public place. And, and the whole family gather. It's a family event. God the Father speaks, this is my beloved son. And the word son is related to the word that's used by Paul in Romans, meaning adoption. This is my adopted one in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit's on his shoulder. And of course, he is the son of God. It's a family gathering. And at that point begins his ministry. That even Jesus has to go from a child to being adopted. And so do we. That's what I was talking about last night about us becoming the adopted sons and daughters of the king. And the government will be upon the shoulders of a son. And that whole crowd in a Messiah event stand. A child is born, a son is given. If I could sing, I would, but it could be the end of... No, my wife wouldn't divorce me over singing, but it would be painful for a few days while she told me I shouldn't do that. A child is born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And a prince is the ultimate son and a princess is the ultimate daughter because a prince or a princess does two things. They serve the king and they serve the people. It's what makes the prince or the princess so incredible, and I love our two princes these days. I love what they're doing. I love how they serve the queen and they serve the people. I love it to bits. I think we have great, great hope in those two young men. I really do, because they're modeling what a real prince looks like. They serve the king and they serve the people. And as we become the sons and daughters and we walk in freedom. Our freedom, our, our freedom is, is, I think this is okay to say it this way, but it's like it's constrained by love. Our freedom's led by love, managed by love, guided by love, empowered by love. There's, there's this whole thing, I don't know whether you read much of it. I, I don't read a lot of it, but it kind of makes me smile a little bit. I, and I think the funniest thing is that, the, you know, the Americans typically, to be honest, on some, you know, News feeds and stuff like that, like poor Megan. Poor Megan, she can't have bare feet, bare legs in public anymore. So it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Poor girl, she has to wear stockings or tights or whatever they're called, you know. 
poor girl, how, how can she put up with, with such terrible circumstances? It's, it's called love. It's called duty. It's a missing word in our world. But true sonship and true daughtership embraces duty out of love. Embraces duty because duty gives us the privilege to be world changers and history makers. Imagine if she said, I'm not marrying you, Harry. I'm not going to step into the family. I'm not going to take my place in being a world changer and a history maker because I have to have bare legs with my short skirts in the summer. What a nonsense. But sometimes we allow that kind of nonsense to get in the way. There is a beauty to duty. Oh, that kind of wraps a little bit, doesn't it? But anyway, it does. There is a beauty to it. There's a beauty to duty, and it's what we stepped into from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We stepped out of, uh, out of as it were, obedience to the law, to this, this life of love and of duty and, and of laying down our lives to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, just like Jesus did. His sons and daughters, they don't go around going, oh, where, 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 poor me. They know the great privilege it is. We have uh, 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 some friends and they'll say things to us like, you know, if the Pope is really saved, which I have no doubt he is, if the Pope is really filled with the Holy Spirit, which I have no doubt he is because ha- I really have had some conversations with people who've had close conversations. They say, well, why doesn't he leave the Catholic Church? Why doesn't he leave the Catholic Church? If he's really, you know, if he's really one of us, he would leave, wouldn't he? Why would he do that? I said, why would he do that? You see, he's willing to put up with a little discomfort over here so that he can influence an entire Christian organization of some one billion or thereabouts people. Why would he give that up? Why would he give up his opportunity? It's called duty. And he's willing to do that. See, we have found ourselves alive at such a time as this, this moment. And the message of sonship and daughtership and the Father's heart is colliding, converging with a moment in history. A moment in history where, where in all honesty, freedom, freedom has never mattered so much and yet freedom has never been so dangerous. And the question is, what will we do with it? We live in a world, freedom's given us so much, hasn't it? Freedom's given us access to a ridiculous amount of information. It's given us opportunity to make choices. Given us opportunity to have so many experiences. Given us opportunity to communicate in so many different ways. So we've got to learn to manage our freedom. But not manage it out of rules, but manage it out of love. And that's why as we become the sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that we know that we're adopted, that we know we became related to Jesus. Do you know, incidentally, adoption. Let's just touch on that just for a moment. Adoption's fascinating. Where the problem is, if I say adoption, typically in the Western world, we think about adopting broken, damaged kids, orphans from Africa with AIDS and stuff like that. It's wonderful. It's great. But it's not the standard of biblical adoption. Biblical adoption is a higher standard. Biblical adoption is this. You fall in love. That's what happens. Fall in love with Jesus. You take the family name. You become called a Christian. And you become joint heirs with him. That's adoption. That's actually what happened to all the women in here that are married. Which is why we're all going to be daughter-in-laws for all eternity. Because we've been adopted. We fell in love with the son. We took the family name. We became joint heirs. Adoption's a higher standard. When we we get adopted, the spirit of adoption takes us to that place. Of being fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. This world needs us to step in to our true identity. Like never before. The, the ninth fruit of the Spirit is the one that probably scares me the most. It scares me because like, if that's a fruit of the Spirit, that means the Holy Spirit has self-control. What's the Holy Spirit needs self-control for? Just an interesting thought to me. 
But the only reason that you and I need self-control is to manage our freedom. And the only reason you need external government is a failure of self-control. Only reason we need external government on this earth is because there's been a failure of internal government. And as we, as we grow as sons and daughters of the King of Kings, we're able to govern and manage and control our freedom. And we're able to manage it and control it and govern it for the purpose of bringing heaven to earth and expanding the influence of the King. Because we're a heaven on earth generation. I don't know whether you noticed that. Our language is different. Our behavior is different. Our expectations different. Somebody stands in front of us dying of cancer. We expect heaven to invade their body. And we're a kingdom generation. Because we're looking around and saying, who can we send into government? Who can we send into medicine? Who can we send into local government, into social work? Who, who can we send? We're, we're not gathering people just to have a nice, warm, fuzzy time in church. We want to change the world. We want to change our society. You want to change Bishop Stortford in this region. That's your desire. That's, that's what's in your heart. And that means that we need to become the sons and daughters who, as I said last night, become the fathers and mothers. Because fathers and mothers are roles carried out by sons and daughters. We have to get this identity. And we are alive at such a time as this. There, there are so many places I can land in the Bible. One of my favorite ones is when Paul says, you're ambassadors. You're ambassadors. We're ambassadors. Do you know, the interesting thing about an ambassador. So you, you'll know this bit. An embassy is a sanctuary. Which is kind of interesting that churches have sanctuaries, isn't it? An embassy is a sanctuary. What is it? Well, you've all watched the movies. It means that if I'm in a foreign country, I can run into the embassy and I am in foreign soil, yes? But did you know this? That where the ambassador lives becomes foreign soil. Now, it's not totally related, but there's, a, and there's at least one cop in the room, so they might know the exact reason. But there is a relationship between that and immunity from fines in cars and stuff like that. The thing, they're related. So here's the thing. Wherever the ambassador lives becomes foreign soil. Yeah? So if you're an ambassador, you just created foreign soil. Wherever you are, you just created the foreign soil of heaven. We're ambassadors. This is how he does his government. And you and I have been born for such a time as this. We've attained royalty. We've become sons and daughters, princes, princesses for such a time as this. It's not coincidence. It's not just this nice sequence of books and stuff that people have put on. There is a convergence, an apostolic move of God, which incidentally, you're all apostolic. Don't look at me weird. You are. I didn't say you're all apostles. You're all apostolic because Jesus said this in John 17 verse 18, as the Father apostled me. Look up the Greek word. It is that word. As the Father sent me equals apostled. As the Father apostled me, so I apostle you. And I don't just speak on account of the 12 that are gathered around me right now, but on everyone who believes on account of their words. That's you and I. We've been sent. You've been sent from heaven to earth with an assignment to make earth like heaven. This is an apostolic move of God. We finally worked it out. Actually, you know, we, we've taken a while to do it, but, but we really are the sent ones. And if we're going to be sent, we have to have a movement of sons and daughters. You see, we can't have controlling leaders up here anymore who are threatened by their, by their congregation. Oh, what would it look like if one of my congregation became bigger than me in my community, in my society? Oh, where do I fit in this? No, we're meant to govern the way that Jesus governed. How did Jesus govern? He governed from down here. He got down here. Philippians said, who in very nature God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a man. He governed from there. And from there he looked up. Everyone, everyone he looked at carried a glory. He looked from here. He took the lowest place. He saw that every man, woman, child ever has lived, ever will live, had a glory, had something inside of them that was worth him dying for. And he didn't die because you're worth less. He died because you're worth it, actually worth him. That's where he governed from. 
He governed from there. He led from there. I have a story that's been exaggerated but the, by other people retelling my story. But the story is this. On a Saturday morning in Feldman Young Offenders Institution, I was a deputy governor. They were carrying a young kid down to the segregation unit. He'd been kicking up and, and they restrained him. My staff restrained him. They were doing everything well and by the book. They weren't doing a thing wrong, but there was a kid in his underpants screaming. And I happened to get to the segregation unit early, earlier than them that day. I got there quicker. And I was, I was in the cell ready for him to come in. I didn't have to be, but sometimes I was. And because I had reasonable relationship, they weren't looking at I was there to check up. In a, you know, in the wrong sort of way. It's like, he's just one of us. He's there to help. They brought this kid in, and it's the only time it ever happened to me. I looked at him, and I think, that, that kid's not angry. He's scared. And they laid him down, and they have rules of how to take the locks off and all of that kind of stuff. All good stuff. And I have no criticism of any of it. But they are supposed to do it in a certain way. And, and they, they brought him into the cell, and I laid on the floor just as I've laid like this. And I laid on the floor. I've only ever done it once. I looked him in the eyes, and I said to my staff, I said, take your hands off him now. And they looked at me for a moment, and then it's like, just do it. It's okay. And they took their hands off him. I only use that illustration for this reason. That's how Jesus governed. I'm not saying I did that every time, because you can't. And I did spend 19 years working in prison, and I never got hit. Real good angel. Real strong, <laughs> manly angel that I have. But my, my point is this. I governed from there that day. I, I took that place. I saw eyeball to eyeball with a scared kid, not an angry kid. See, that's where Jesus governed from there. Secure in his identity. Secure in who he is and what he came to do. And he governed from there and he looked up. And, and you know, Philippians that details that so beautifully and so stunningly. It goes, it goes on to say in Philippians 2.13, says this. Let me just quote it exactly so I don't butcher it, which I've been known to do. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That comes after the great passage about Jesus, who in very nature God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It goes on to say, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's the same as Jesus, who only did the things that pleased his father. We're in the same family. And this is our moment. Will we rise up? Will we be the sons and daughters? who become the fathers and mothers. And that's where I want to go as we end, because I, I want to unpack a couple of things. You see, if we can become sons and daughters. We took care of some of that last night. Maybe some more of you will, will say, I want to go deeper into that. I want to receive the spirit of adoption by which I can truly cry, Abba, Father. And as I was saying last night, I don't just want to jump in Daddy's lap. I want... Male to male, adult to adult relationship with Jesus Christ. I want eyeball to eyeball relationship with the man, the real man, Jesus Christ. I want him to treat me as a man. I want to treat him as a man. I want him to treat you as a woman and you to treat him as a man. I, I want that. But we can have that. But there's another step that we're meant to take because that step is that we're to become the fathers and mothers that this world needs. Because this world needs some Mordecais who adopt the orphaned influences, who are secure in their identity. I mean, Mordecai, he's older, he's more experienced, he's probably wiser. His, his young niece is in the palace. I mean, not sure what's going on. She's beautifying herself. She goes through her six months, you know, purification, her six months beautification. She's there. She's amongst the, you know, the young virgins of the country and there's Mordecai outside, but he's secure in who he is. And he's sending messages in to his young niece. He's secure. He's confident in who he is. The world needs Mordecais and Mordecesses, if there is such a name. But something sometimes gets in our way. Now, I want to touch on it. You see, we, we need to become fathers and mothers who don't just know, embrace sonship, but are able to be the mothers and fathers that this world needs. 
I can tell you this. I don't, I've been called, I've had a few titles. I've been a nurse. I've been staff nurse. I've been a prison officer. I've been prison governor. I've been given a few titles. I've been called a few names. But I'll tell you one. One name, one title that is my absolute favorite title of them all. And that is Father. That's my favorite title on this planet. To be a dad, to be father. But it's been a journey. And the enemy doesn't want you to step into that role. He doesn't stop, want you to step into it. Ladies, he doesn't want you to step into your ability or your capacity to reveal the father. He's, he chucks a whole bunch of stuff in the way. Of feminism that gets thrown in the way. Of people who think that somehow we should call God, mother. And we, we have all this confusion. Yeah, I'm here to tell you today, ladies, we need you to reveal the Father as ladies, as women. Because the devil is throwing lies in the way. He wants to tell you, you can't do that. You're a woman. How can a woman reveal the Father? Well, I know some women who've raised kids. I know a woman who's raised 11 kids on her own. And she did one of the best jobs of raising kids I've ever seen. And those kids are secure in their identity as sons and daughters. More secure, perhaps, than many I've ever met. She had an ability to reveal the Father. And of course, Genesis 1.26 says, Let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them. That's why I say, if you've got a problem with women in leadership after Genesis 1.26, go back to Genesis 1.26. I get it. I know we need people to write books and stuff like that. I get it. But you're made in the image of God. He's a good leader. So I don't know where we got that other thing from. Except, well, I do, obviously. See, there are lies. There are lies that step in that will tell you that you can't be a father. There are lies that step in that say you can't father people because you're a woman. Well, you're going you're gonna to reveal the father as a woman. Now, we don't have language for it. That's the problem. We, we don't have language for it. But God said, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, male and female. All I know is this. That there are male attributes of God and there are female attributes of God. And the females carry more of the female ones and the male carry more of the male ones. But some of the men carry some of the female and some of the females carry some of the men. And we don't really have a full language for it. But one thing I know is we've got to stop anything that prevents women from knowing that they revealed the Father. We have got to stop it. Whatever it looks like, we have to stop it. And we'll struggle with language, but we have to stop it. I believe this. I believe that women need to lead as women. <laughs> and I'm prepared to say this. The reason why we haven't seen revivals that never end is related to it. It's related to it. So I'm going to give you very quickly, because I felt that I should address this today. I'm going to give you my six points, the only six points I have on women. You won't find a book from me. You will find a chapter in a book, but that's it. Number one, women in leadership. Just do it. <laughs> Number two, don't argue the theology. It's very clear to me, Genesis 126. Most of the other theology is based on circumstance and context and culture and stuff like that. You can read it. I'm not saying don't read Chris Vallotton's book. It's genius. I'm not saying don't read Danny's stuff. I'm not saying don't read other people's stuff. It's just don't get caught up on it because it will distract, distract you from the assignment, which is do it. And number three, don't give a woman a job they're not qualified for. But don't give a man a job he's not qualified for either. <laughs> So those are points one, two, and three. Are we okay? Yeah. Good. Second set of three points is when women lead as women, they give us something which is missing today. Yeah. When women lead as women, they have a greater concern for the effect on the whole community. They just do. They're wired that way. 
I think that some of it, obviously, is related to the fact that men and women have spent many years and many generations in a community called a family with a lot of different people in that family, and they understand the effect of decision A on the whole family. They think that way. Guys don't. We're like, we tend to be more selfish. We just think, well, it'll work for one. It, that's okay. The rest will have to suck it up or whatever. <laughs> See, women do. They have an instinctive awareness. If you do that, my wife says, well, if you do that, do you know how they'll feel? Oh, yeah, got it. Good point. All right, okay. So number one, women have a greater concern for the effect on the whole community. See, some of the problems with some of the revivals that we've seen has been that they haven't acknowledged the effect on the whole community. They take one, just one piece and they, they don't recognize the effect on everybody. Number two, women have a greater concern for the effect of the generations to come. Now that is probably related to this. They give birth to them. And there is something different in the investment of a woman in the next generation. It's just, it's just different. You know, it's the classic example, of course, isn't it? You know, the, the, you know, the mum who sees her kids in any way hurting or being threatened will become like, a, you know, a wild bear and, you know, whatever. You know, don't touch my kids, don't <laughs> harm my kids. But there is this deep-seated concern for the generation to come. But well, what have we failed to do? We failed to pass revival to the next generation. See, we failed to recognize the effect on the whole community. We failed to pass it to the next generation. And thirdly, women care about sustainability more than men. Men se seem to think, now I'm not saying all do, but men tend to think in, in a more, well, it'll work for a week or two. Now, my wife's like this for me. The best example is my blog, which I'm beginning to get sorted out. But it's like, Paul, if you're going to start writing a blog, are you going to sustain it? Immediately, she's in there. Can you keep it going? Whatever you start today, that good idea you've had, can you sustain it? What do we need? What does revival need? Sustainability. Now, I know that this can be delicate in some communities. I know there's been politics. I know there's been history. But all I'm saying is we've got to work out how to do this. We've got to work it out. It's not always easy. I get around some people and, and they talk about co-leading. It's like, yeah, I'm not sure whether that necessarily works. I'm not sure whether co-leading between with a man and a woman co-leading works any better than a man and a man co-leading. If, if, if you know, so we've got to work this thing out. But all I know is that there is a missing piece, and if we don't get that missing piece back in the puzzle, we are not going to see what we are believing for and dreaming for. Is that okay? So we have to end the lie that says, I'm a woman, so I can't reveal the Father. That lie has to end. There's one lie that has to go. I can't give you the exact language for it. I'm sorry, I can't. All I know is that the Bible says, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. Number two, another lie. This lie is very personal to me. And it's part of my journey that began with a prophetic word that said that I would preach in stadiums, raise up young evangelists, and God would restore to me the reason why he brought me into the kingdom. I was given that word, I said last night, I went to Reinhard Bonnke's School of Evangelism, the most surprised man I know that I got to be in that room. I had three serious experiences with the Lord during that week. Came back from that, preached in Nuremberg. Couldn't believe I got to do that. But I found myself at uh, a meal table. I was in a meal table and a man, his wife came to the meal table. Now I was sitting in a, they call them yards in America. It's actually a beautiful garden. But sitting in a backyard, I was wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses, which apparently makes me look a little bit harsher, apparently. I think it makes me look 10 years younger because I'm not bald with a baseball cap. But anyway, <laughs> and... Uh, Men, women came and sat at the table. I started asking questions and I said to him, I said, uh, so what, what makes your healing ministry different from someone else's healing ministry? I was just doing what I do. I always do that. I just ask questions. Apparently they felt that I was a little bit harsh or something. The glasses, the baseball cap, the questions. They, they went back to their, their hotel room and they had a little bit of a conversation about, who was that guy? But Jean-Luc, who was one of the two, 
who's become a really good friend of mine, said to his wife, I don't know who he was, but I want him to be the architect for Europe Shall Be Safe strategy team. Now, I didn't know that. Sunday comes along, and uh, Jean-Luc was there with his wife, Josie Ann. I tell their names because the first time I told this story, I got told off for not telling their names. So now I tell their names. I'm not name dropping, I'm just honoring them. So they were sitting in the row behind me on a Sunday night. And uh, I climbed over the chair and I began to pray for Jean-Luc. I prayed a prayer for Jean-Luc and his wife began to cry. Always a good sign. (laughs) He then put his head on my shoulder and he sat some 10, maybe 15 minutes with his head on my shoulder and my arm around him. And uh, that is not the most comfortable position. A little bit like Leif Hetland kissing me on the cheek story last night. It's not the most comfortable place for us European guys to find ourselves. i got Jean-Luc sitting here like this. And then he sat up and he said, Paul, I've been prayed for by some of the best evangelists in the world. They were all brothers who wanted to tell me in their prayer how to do my job better. But tonight, a father of evangelists prayed for me. Do you even know the prophetic word that I've been given, that I'm going to raise up, young evangelist? But as he said that, I'm like, I'm not qualified. How can I possibly be qualified? How can I father you, Jean-Luc? You're an evangelist, a healing evangelist with a reputation. And I'm, I'm, I'm not that. I, I don't walk down the street and lead people to Jesus. I'm not, I've not spent my whole life in evangelistic crusades. I don't count my friends as being people like Reinhard Bonnke and stuff like that. How can I be that, Jean-Luc? And I realized something as I thought it through. I have two sons. One is a great musician. He can play anything you give him. I play CDs. I play them pretty good. I even do playlists now on Apple. (laughs) I'm really good at that. But other than my beautiful wife, I can tell you who my son wants in the audience when he's doing something. His non-music playing dad. He wants my encouragement. He wants me to say, well done, I'm proud of you, son. I I don't do music. And I realize that in the natural, none of us have a problem with fathering people who are better at something than we are. But why in the spiritual do we do that? I think it's one of the greatest lies of the enemy that somehow, you see, if I can go back to man of God here, using that, is that, that picture of the most important person in the room in a church service for hundreds of years. We've got to end that. Man of God is a son. He's a son who's a father, who's looking out at a congregation full of doctors and members of parliament and artists and creatives and entrepreneurs. And he's looking at them and going, I can father you. I don't have to be better than you at what you do. All you need from me is to know that I love you. I believe in you. I'm cheering you on. I'm here for you. I am going to lift you up. I'm going to send you out Sunday by Sunday so you can go back to what you do where you're sent to do it. And you can be the person that God made you to be. Not limited by the structure and the religion of a church. Not limited by the weakness, by the orphan heart of a leader. But encouraged and propelled to greatness. That's why we need the message of sonship and the Father's heart. So that we can release the sons and daughters to get out there in the world and stand up with confidence and courage. You see, too many of us have been raised in a church where we weren't allowed to be confident about who we are, so we've struggled when we got out into the workplace. And we've not had the confidence in the workplace to stand up. And we've had other people who are standing up and shouting and screaming and hollering and controlling out of their orphan heartedness. But we have not been raised to be the sons and daughters of the King of Kings because we've not had the fathers and mothers who would raise us up. And that day, 
when John Luke said that to me, began a journey that ended that and has led to me to a place that I never dreamed I would have had. That when I go to Awakening Europe, these evangelists, some of them call me Pop or Dad. Or they introduce me on a stage and they say, here's Paul. He's the father of evangelists. What? How did I qualify? How did I qualify for that? Not because I'm clever. Not at all. But because I worked it out with him and with my good friend, John Luke. You see in this room are mums and dads. There are kids out there. There are sons and daughters. They don't need you to be better at what they do. It's pretty much impossible these days anyway. They're faster on that technology stuff and communication stuff and creative stuff. They're way ahead of us. So if we're trying to catch them up, forget it. Just believe in them. Just stand with them. Love them. Get on the touch line. And stand there and not go, oh, I didn't have that. So why should I give that? No. Let's stand on the touchline and go, I'm a dad. I'm a mum. I believe in you. You're a world changer. You're a history maker. That's what we need to be. The devil's destroying these lies. You're a woman. You can't reveal the father. You're not better at something than your sons and daughters. So how can you be their dad? These lies that come to us. Lies, some of them I touched on last night. Like, I've failed. Well, Jesus will be known for all eternity of this, as the son of an adulterous murderer. So that shouldn't be a problem. And we worship one whose name is Redeemer. And actually the truth is that your redeemed life after a failure is stronger than it was before. Yes. One of these days I'll own a piece of that Japanese china called Kintsugi. Do you know what it is? Where they break a broken piece of china is repaired with gold. It's an art. You look at it and you think, that's beautiful. And it's stronger and more beautiful and more valuable than it was before it got broken. It's you and I. So get rid of that lie that you failed. Get rid of it. I got a scar on my hand. That's the strongest piece of my skin. The scar is stronger than the rest of the skin. I'm not married. There's another lie. I am married, by the way. So it came out a bit weird, didn't it? I'm not married. It's a lie. I don't have kids. It's a lie. Jesus didn't have any natural kids. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have a natural father. He's eternal father and son of God, son of David. These are lies. The enemy wants to feed us these lies so that we don't step into the role of being the mums and dads who reveal the father. We need to stop these lies. step into who he made us to be and who he created us to be so that we can raise up the world changers and the history makers because I don't know whether you realize it but that's our job description because if we're meant to be like Christ he changed the world and he made history and you might think well I can't do that yeah you can you can start with you you can start just with your corner of the world you can change your world you're a world changer you can influence your corner of the world. You can change that corner of the world. So the enemy throws us these lies because he doesn't want us to graduate from sonship and daughtership and become the fathers and mothers who reveal the father. greatest privilege any of us will ever have to walk alongside sons and daughters to cheer them on to love them 
actually some of the other challenges are that we don't realize how valuable we are to these people. Told you a little bit last night, it'll be, it'll be on the television soon, so I'm not telling anything that won't be very public. Um, TBN, there's, I probably told you last night, TBN series, Friday night, 6.35 on TBN. I've called it Perspectives, Life, Work and Faith, episode five. I interview or spend half an hour with two people who other than our natural kids, I would say, without any shadow of a doubt, are our closest kids. A year ago, we sat in the room with them while they had a stillborn baby. The three days we spent with a, my wife gave a beautiful phrase, she was born sleeping with Jesus. And we've walked with them through a year. And the value they have for one word, a text reply, just to know that we were awake, just to know that we were thinking of them, just to know that, and it's usually my wife, but you know, there's the note, there's the card, there's the encouragement, there's something that we, we were there with them for the, the 365 days that they've just passed to the baby's first birthday, to, to spend that birthday with them, to acknowledge that, but to realize how valuable that is to them. There are so many people out there who just haven't had the experience of a good dad on earth. So how on earth can they relate to a good dad in heaven? They can't. But you're the answer to reveal the Father. They don't need you to preach to them. They don't need your theology. They don't need your eschatology. They need your heart. They need your love. That's what they need. We're going to minister in a moment. I'll close with this. I was running my prison, Huntercombe Young Offenders. I was in charge of it. Had a rap academy in my prison. It's kind of funny, but I did. They called me MC the Gov. <laughs> I'd walk in that room, 45 black kids nearly always, maybe one white one, rapping. Had the opportunity to take one of them up to uh, Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons. And... Uh, they were doing a whole research project on, uh, on juvenile prisons. Went into London with this young man called Rusty. Went on the train and the tube together, had lunch together. I know that might seem weird to some people, but you can't train a man for freedom in captivity. You have to see what they're like when you let them out. In all honesty, we did have, we had a lot of fun, we laughed a lot. He introduced me to a few of his friends, which was a bit scary in some places. He certainly took me into a coffee shop I probably wouldn't go into on my own. <laughs> but we were in front of the chief inspector of prisons and he was with me, this young man, and they asked lots of questions and there was loads of things discussed and there was conversation that didn't involve Rusty and I. We got to end and I really respected and it was, a, it, it was such a beautiful thing that the, the chief inspector did. He got to the end, he said, okay, he looked... He said, okay, Rusty, you're going to have the last word in this room. I'll give you the last word. If you could leave one word, one lasting impression on us, would you do it? Rusty, to my knowledge, isn't a Christian. Does a bit of rap for me, sings some rap stuff. And he looked him and he said, we're just a bunch of hurting people who need somebody to show that they love us. That's what he said. I didn't, I didn't give him the script. But the world's full of people just like that. And they need us to be secure as sons and daughters so that we can be the mums and dads, so that we can reveal the Father, so that we can show that this book isn't a book about judgment. This book's not a book about punishment. He's coming back to judge for us. It's deliverance day. He's a good dad. But so many people haven't experienced that. That's why the devil's scared. He's scared that we find out who we really are. And we become who we were called to be. And we do what he wants us to do. And that we become a generation who say things like this. I must be about my father's business. I only want to do the things that please my father. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. We have to end the lies. So that we can reveal the Father. And ladies, I'm sorry I don't have the right language. I'm sorry I can't 
put it together in some way that says, that's exactly it. But my language is simply this. We need you. We need you to reveal the Father. And anybody that has said you can't or you shouldn't or has tried to stop you or has hurt you or has harmed you or has put you in one box or another box, I'm sorry that we've done that. But all I want to know is that you're willing to say yes, that you would reveal the Father as a woman. Reveal the Father as a woman. And I want to start by inviting you. If you are willing to say yes to reveal the Father as a woman, I want to invite you to stand. And if somebody someday finds the language, send it to me. (laughs) Write to me. And my very good friend, Lindy Conant, circuit riders, she wrote a song. It's a song I absolutely adore, but my wife loves it too. And I I went out to, to, uh, to LA and I got the chance to interview Lindy. And I said, Lindy, I want to ask you a question. Why did you write this song? Where did you get the idea for this song? She said, I got it from Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. The words of the song are this. There's a yes in our hearts. And it carries through eternity. Simple obedience changes history. When she told me she got it from Mary, I couldn't wait to tell Sue, my wife Sue. Because her favorite is when Mary says, she pondered these things in her heart. There's a yes. I want you to ponder this in your heart. I want you to say yes and ponder it in your heart. What does this mean to release the women to reveal the Father? What does it mean? Would you ponder it in your heart? Would you play around with it? Would you chew it around and would you say, there's a yes in my heart? I don't really know what it exactly means. There's a yes in my heart. And it carries through eternity. Simple obedience changes history. Father, thank you for every woman standing. I'm asking that you would release something today that changes history, that changes history. This yes that says, I will reveal the Father. I don't quite have the right words. I don't know what it looks like. I know that there's a mother heart of God. I know there's parts of God that are feminine, that are that represented in that way. I don't exactly know what it means, but I know something. My assignment is no different from the man sitting next to me. My assignment, be Christ-like, and Christ revealed the Father. Father, I pray that you would release something today that would shake history. Because it's time. We need, we need women evangelists who reveal the Father. Women prophets who reveal the Father. Women apostles who reveal the Father. Women pastors who reveal the Father. Women teachers who reveal the Father. But we need women, members of parliament, and business women, and teachers. And so many of those places have them already, but I believe they're going to be sent out afresh with a confidence to do what they're called to do. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. I want to I want to go for one other group of people. It's male and female, but if you want to join me in the breakthrough that I had, that I can father people even if I'm not better than them at what they do. If that's been a problem to you, if you've looked around and thought, oh, I can't do that. You see, what you're doing is you're missing the value that they place on you. Not on your ability, but on what you bring. That's, that's what's missing. And they need you. Our two kids, Luke and Claire, they need us. They've got mums and dads, but we carry something that they need. We carry a perspective. We carry an encouragement. We, we carry something that they need. My wife carries an extraordinary wisdom for, a, for a, a journey that's included our own challenges and miscarriages and infertility. And other battles in life, she carries something. She doesn't have to tell lots of stories to them. They just know she's been there. She's done that. When she says, you're going to make it through, we're going to make it through. Because she said, we're going to make it through. She's revealing the Father to us. 
if that's you, if you've like, you haven't really felt able to step into being a father, a mother, to the people around you because you're, you're intimidated, because they seem to be better at things than you are. They're more competent. Maybe they're articulate, more articulate. If that's got in the way, I'm going to invite you to stand. Because I believe he wants to release the fathers today. Oh, there are a couple of other things in my list. Age is a lie as well, by the way. Just in case there's anyone thinking, I can't stand, I'm only 12. You can reveal the father. Because that's another lie. You're not old enough. No, it's just a lie. You can encourage somebody who's older than you. If you're secure in who you are, Father, release the fathers today. Release the fathers. Remove the barriers. Remove the obstacles. Remove the faulty thinking that's gone on that says, I can't bring encouragement to that person. Because I'm not better than that. You know, there are sports stars out there who need the encouragement of a father. And you'll never be better than them at their sport, but they need you. Actors, actresses, movie stars, successful people, entrepreneurs, they're struggling, they're broken. Some of them end up dying in New York apartments from overdoses, and the missing thing is mums and dads who know how to love, encourage, believe, care, champion, lift up, cheer on. So, Father, I'm asking that you would release today the fathers from here, from this, from this room. Dare to believe that there are champions being released right now. Not because of their ability, not because of their talent, not because of their skill, but because of their heart. Because they're secure in who they are, they're secure in why they're alive. Father, would you release an army of fathers and mothers who know who they are, who know why they're alive, who know what they do, who know where they're going, who revealed the Father. Cancel the lies. Cancel them right now. seated I'm going to go very general but I have a feeling that some of you while I was speaking who are thinking I think I've been reading the Bible the wrong way I think I've been reading a book that punished and didn't protect I think I've been reading a judgment book and not a deliverance book I think I've been reading a book that had more rules and relationships. I think I, I need to change the way I read the Bible. I need to change my perception of God. He's a good father. I, I think I need to change the way that I view me discovering my destiny. That he wants to give me the desires of my heart. He loves me. That as I was talking, you were thinking through some of those things. You think there's a, just a shift. I need, to, I need to capitalize on this shift in my thinking. I want to invite you to stand if that's you. It could be any of those. You're just thinking there's some shifts I need to take. I need to do some adjustment. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you thought you were heading for the moon. You start in the journey half a degree off and you're missing the moon by miles. It's just a little course correction. Just a little tweak, just a little adjustment. So that you can worship him as a good father. And you can read that God so loved the world, that he loves you, he cares for you, he gives you the desires of your heart. He, he wants to bless you, he wants you to succeed, he wants you to prosper, he wants you to have abundant life. That you're not heading for judgment day but for deliverance day that he's judging for you he's with you and father i'm asking change the way we think about you about your word about the holy spirit about the songs that we sing 
about the way that you see us and that out of us, out of that, that we will experience more of the freedom because it was for freedom that Christ has set us free and the ultimate free people are sons and daughters, sons and daughters who know their dad, who know who they are, who know why they're alive, who know where they're going. Set us free, I pray. Let's all stand, just close. And I'll hand back to Gareth. There's never been a better time to be alive. Never been a better time to be alive than this time. So, Father, I thank you that we're alive at such a time as this. Release the Mordecai's. Adopt the orphaned influences. Yes. Anyone here who's out there doing incredible works, but nobody knows and nobody's recognized and nobody's come alongside, give them a Mordecai. Give them an uncle who can adopt the orphan influencer, no matter what age they are. Release the Mordecai's for such a time as this. Because we are so glad that we're alive at such a time as this. This moment, this heaven on earth moment, this kingdom moment, this destiny moment, this identity moment, you chose for us to be alive at such a time as this, to be part of a generation who lived to bring heaven to earth, who lived to expand the influence of King Jesus, who know who we are and know why we're alive. We thank you and I ask you to bless us as your sons and as your daughters in your name. Amen.